hey, chapter nine's vocabulary was mortal, grimacing, affectionately, superiority, menace, conformity, stifled. We did chapter eight yesterday. Leery, contempt, contracted, and agony. Now, by the end of this week, you should have all your vocabulary words and your definitions down, okay? I'm going to give you just a few more minutes to uh, work on your vocab, then we're going to go on to our terms. All right, I want to go on so we can get part of eight, or rest of eight done and part of nine. Let's look at our terms, which we already did, seven, eight, and nine. Let's go on to our idioms, our expressions. Remember, our idioms are phrases that say one thing but mean something completely different. Uh, all right, page 13, please, in your packets. Chapter 8. Page 13. Chapter 8. Cuss us out. Call us every kind of profanity or swear words that she could think of. Now, of course, it says she. Generally, we would have thought it was what character? Probably doing the cursing. Or, yes. Too bitter dally. However, this time it says she, so we're going to have someone new that we're going to meet today. That Now, two, listening, two of a kind means that they're very much alike in many different ways. Passed out cold. Passed out cold means to faint. Almost jumped out of my skin. Was totally frightened or startled. Get away with murder is not to receive any punishment or any trouble for something that you did. Uh, remember two bits, mom lets him get away with murder. Okay. That's where the phrase came from, too. Um, play chicken is to act like you're afraid. Uh, what's up with the big times? What are you guys doing? It's usually a friendly greeting, like, hey, what's up with the big times? Like, hey, guys, what's up? Booze hound is one who drinks alcohol to excess. We are going to get into part of nine, so let's do those words. Spruced up is to clean up and get nicely dressed. In a jam is to be in some kind of trouble. Um... Get the hints. It's just a uh, reference to the Bible. It means get over here. Um, off my nut. It just means that you're crazy. And get somewhere is make a successful person of yourself. So you're going to get somewhere in life. And um, start the fireworks means that who's going to start the action. This is probably who's going to be starting the uh, rumble. And then bopper is just another word for fighter, which he's going to explain in the in the narration as well. One who is involved in a rumble. Um, sit tight. Sit firmly in your seat, holding um, holding on for security. Like sit tight, you know, stay still. Um, give me any statistic. Or sorry, <laughs> give me any static. Give me any static means to give me any trouble or try to stop me. Now, open your books, please, to chapter eight. What page is chapter eight on? What page is chapter 8 on? Come on. 119. Thank you. Get your books open. Make sure you're following along. Ready? Yes. 119. Thank you. Chapter 8. The nurses wouldn't let us see Johnny. He was in critical condition, no visitors. But Tubit wouldn't take no for an answer. That was his buddy in there, and he aimed to see him. We both begged and pleaded, but we were getting nowhere until the doctor found out what was going on. Let them go in, he said to the nurse. He's been asking for them. It can't hurt now. Tubit didn't notice the expression in his voice. It's true, I thought numbly. He is dying. We went in, practically on tiptoe, because the quietness of the hospital scared us. Johnny was lying still with his eyes closed, but when Two-Bit said, Hey, Johnny kid, he opened them and looked at us, trying to grin. Hey, y'all. The nurse who was pulling the shades open smiled and said, So, he can talk after all. Tubit looked around. They treating you okay, kid? Don't, Johnny gasped. Don't let me put enough grease on my hair. Don't talk, Tubit said, pulling up a chair. Just listen. 
We'll bring you some hair grease next time. We're having the big rumble tonight. Johnny's huge black eyes widened a little, but he didn't say anything. It's too bad you and Dally can't be in it. It's the first big rumble we've had, not counting the time we whipped Shepard's outfit. He came by, Johnny said. Tim Shepard? Johnny nodded. Came to see Dally. Tim and Dallas had always been buddies. Did you know you got your name in the paper for being a hero? Johnny almost grinned as he nodded. Tough enough, he managed, and by the way his eyes were glowing, I figured Southern gentlemen had nothing on Johnny Cade. I could see that even a few words were tiring him out. He was as pale as the pillow and looked awful. Two-bit pretended not to notice. You want anything besides hair grease, kid? Johnny barely nodded. The book. He looked at me. Can you get another one? Two-Bit looked at me, too. I hadn't told him about Gone with the Wind. He wants a copy of Gone with the Wind so I can read it to him, I explained. You want to run down to the drugstore and get one? Okay, Two-Bit said cheerfully. Don't y'all run off. I sat down in Two-Bit's chair and tried to think of something to say. Dally's going to be okay, I said finally. And Darry and me, we're okay now. I knew Johnny understood what I meant. We had always been close buddies, and those lonely days in the church strengthened our friendship. He tried to smile again, and then suddenly went white and closed his eyes tight. Johnny, I said, alarmed. Are you okay? He nodded, keeping his eyes closed. Yeah, it just hurts sometimes. It usually don't. I can't feel anything below the middle of my back. He lay breathing heavily for a moment. I'm pretty bad off, ain't I, Pony? You'll be okay, I said with fake cheerfulness. You gotta be. We couldn't get along without you. The truth of that last statement hit me. We couldn't get along without him. We needed Johnny as much as he needed the gang, and for the same reason. I won't be able to walk again, Johnny started, then faltered. Not even on crutches. Busted my back. You'll be okay, I repeated firmly. Don't start crying, I commanded myself. Don't start crying, you'll scare Johnny. You want to know something, pony boy? I'm scared stiff. I used to talk about killing myself. He drew a quivering breath. I don't want to die now. It ain't long enough. Sixteen years ain't long enough. I wouldn't mind it so much if there wasn't so much stuff I ain't done yet and so many things I ain't seen. It's not fair. You know what? That time we were in Windricksville was the only time I've been away from our neighborhood. You ain't gonna die, I said, trying to hold my voice down. And don't get juiced up, because the doc won't let us see you no more if you do. Sixteen years on the streets and you can learn a lot. But all the wrong things, not the things you want to learn. Sixteen years on the streets and you see a lot. But all the wrong sights, not the sights you want to see. Johnny closed his eyes and rested quietly for a minute. Years of living on the east side teaches you how to shut off your emotions. If you didn't, you would explode. You learn to cool it. A nurse appeared in the doorway. Johnny, she said quietly, your mother's here to see you. Johnny opened his eyes. At first they were wide with surprise, then they darkened. I don't want to see her, he said firmly. She's your mother. I said I don't want to see her. His voice was rising. She's probably come to tell me about all the trouble I'm causing her and how glad her and the old man will be when I'm dead. Well, tell her to leave me alone for once. His voice broke. For once, just to leave me alone. He was struggling to sit up, 
but he suddenly gasped, went whiter than the pillowcase, and passed out cold. The nurse hurried me out the door. I was afraid of something like this if he saw anyone. I ran into Tubit, who was coming in. You can't see him now, the nurse said, so Tubit handed her the book. Make sure he can see it when he comes around. She took it and closed the door behind her. Tubit stood and looked at the door a long time. I wish it was any one of us except Johnny, he said, and his voice was serious for once. We could get along without anyone but Johnny. Turning abruptly, he said, let's go see Dallas. As we walked out into the hall, we saw Johnny's mother. I knew her. She was a little woman with straight black hair and big black eyes like Johnny's, but that was as far as the resemblance went. Johnny Cake's eyes were fearful and sensitive. Hers were cheap and hard. As we passed her, she was saying, but I have a right to see him. He's my son. After all the trouble his father and I have gone to to raise him, this is our reward. He'd rather see those no-count hoodlums than his own folks. She saw us and gave us such a look of hatred that I almost backed up. It was your fault. Always running around in the middle of the night getting jailed and heaven knows what else. I thought she was going to cuss us out. I really did. Tubit's eyes got narrow and I was afraid he was going to start something. I don't like to hear women get sworn at, even if they deserve it. No wonder he hates your guts, Two-Bit snapped. He was going to tell her off real good, but I shoved him along. I felt sick. No wonder Johnny didn't want to see her. No wonder he stayed overnight at Two-Bits or at our house and slept in the vacant lot in good weather. I remembered my mother beautiful and golden like soda, and wise and firm like dairy. Oh, Lordy. There was a catch in Two-Bit's voice, and he was closer to tears than I'd ever seen him. He has to live with that. We hurried to the elevator to get to the next floor. I hoped the nurse would have enough sense not to let Johnny's mother see him. It would kill him. Dally was arguing with one of the nurses when we came in. He grinned at us. Man, am I glad to see you. These hospital people won't let me smoke, and I want out. We sat down, grinning at each other. Dally was his usual mean, ornery self. He was okay. Shepard came by to see me a while ago. That's what Johnny said. What did he want? Said he saw my picture in the paper and couldn't believe it didn't have wanted, dead, or alive under it. He mostly came to rub it in about the rumble. Man, I hate not being in that. Only last week, Tim Shepard had cracked three of Dally's ribs. But Dally and Tim Shepard had always been buddies. No matter how they fought, they were two of a kind and they knew it. Dally was grinning at me. Kid, you scared the devil out of me the other day. I thought I'd killed you. Me? I said, puzzled. Why? When you jumped out of the church, I meant to hit you just hard enough to knock you down and put out the fire. But when you dropped like a ton of lead, I thought I'd aim too high and broke your neck. He thought for a minute. I'm glad I didn't, though. I'll bet, I said with a grin. I'd never liked Dally, but then, for the first time, I felt like he was my buddy, and all because he was glad he hadn't killed me. Dally looked out the window. Uh, he sounded very casual. How's the kid? We just left him, Two-Bit said, and I could tell that he was debating whether to tell Dally the truth or not. I don't know about stuff like this, but... Well, he seemed pretty bad to me. He passed out cold before we left him. Dally's jawline went white as he swore between clenched teeth. Two-bit, you still got that fancy black-handled switch? Yeah. Give it here. Two-bit reached into his back pocket for his prized possession. It was a jet-handled switchblade, ten inches long, that would flash open at the mere breath. 
It was the reward of two hours of walking aimlessly around a hardware store to divert suspicion. He kept it razor sharp. As far as I knew, he had never pulled it on anyone. He used his plain pocket knife when he needed a blade. But it was his showpiece, his pride and joy. Every time he ran into a new hood, he pulled it out and showed off with it. Dally knew how much that knife meant to Two-Bit, and if he needed a blade bad enough to ask for it, well, he needed a blade. That was all there was to it. Two-Bit handed it over to Dally without a moment's hesitation. We gotta win that fight tonight, Dally said. His voice was hard. We gotta get even with the socius. For Johnny. He put the switch under his pillow and lay back, staring at the ceiling. We left. We knew better than to talk to Dally when his eyes were blazing and he was in a mood like that. We decided to catch a bus home. I just didn't feel much like walking or trying to hitch a ride. Two-Bit left me sitting on the bench at the bus stop while he went to a gas station to buy some cigarettes. I was kind of sick to my stomach and sort of groggy. I was nearly asleep when I felt someone's hand on my forehead. I almost jumped out of my skin. Two-Bit was looking down at me worriedly. You feel okay? You're awful hot. I'm all right, I said, and when he looked at me as if he didn't believe me, I got a little panicky. Don't tell Darry, okay? Come on, Two-Bit, be a buddy. I'll be well by tonight. I'll take a bunch of aspirins. All right, Two-Bit said reluctantly. But Darry will kill me if you're really sick and go ahead and fight anyway. I'm okay, I said, getting a little angry. And if you keep your mouth shut, Darry won't know a thing. You know something, Two-Bit said as we were riding home on the bus. You'd think you could get away with murder living with your big brother and all, but Darry's stricter with you than your folks were, ain't he? Yeah, I said, but they'd raised two boys before me. Darry hasn't. You know, the only thing that keeps Darry from being a soch is us. I know, I said. I had known it for a long time. In spite of not having much money, the only reason Darry couldn't be a soch was us, the gang, me and Soda. Darry was too smart to be a greaser. I don't know how I knew, I just did. And I was kind of sorry. I was silent most of the way home. I was thinking about the rumble. I had a sick feeling in my stomach, and it wasn't from being ill. It was the same kind of helplessness I'd felt that night Darry yelled at me for going to sleep in the lot. I had the same deathly fear that something was going to happen that none of us could stop. As we got off the bus, I finally said it. Tonight, I don't like it one bit. Two-Bit pretended not to understand. I never knew you to play chicken in a rumble before, not even when you was a little kid. I knew he was trying to make me mad, but I took the bait anyway. I ain't chicken, Two-Bit Matthews, and you know it, I said angrily. Ain't I a Curtis, same as Soda and Derry? Two-Bit couldn't deny this, so I went on. I mean, I got an awful feeling something's gonna happen. Something is gonna happen. We're gonna stomp the Soch's guts, that's what. Two-Bit knew what I meant, but doggedly pretended not to. He seemed to feel that if you said something was all right, it immediately was, no matter what. He's been that way all his life, and I don't expect he'll change. Soda Pop would have understood, and we would have tried to figure it out together, but Two-Bit just ain't Soda, not by a long shot. Cherry Valance was sitting in her Corvette by the vacant lot when we came by. Her long hair was pinned up, and in daylight, she was even better looking. That Stingray was one tough car, a bright red one. It was cool. Hi, Pony Boy, she said. Hi, Two-Bit. Two-Bit stopped. Apparently, Cherry had shown up there before, during the week Johnny and I had spent in Windricksville. 
What's up with the big times? She tightened the strings on her ski jacket. They play your way. No weapons, fair deal, your rules. You sure? She nodded. Randy told me. He knows for sure. Two-bit turned and started home. Thanks, Cherry. Pony boy, stay a minute, Cherry said. I stopped and went back to her car. Randy's not going to show up at the rumble. Yeah, I said. I know. He's not scared. He's just sick of fighting. Bob, she swallowed, then went on quietly. Bob was his best buddy since grade school. I thought of Soda and Steve. What if one of them saw the other killed? Would that make them stop fighting? No, I thought. Maybe it would make Soda stop, but not Steve. He'd go on hating and fighting. Maybe that was what Bob would have done if it had been Randy instead of him. How's Johnny? Not so good, I said. Will you go up to see him? She shook her head. No, I couldn't. Why not? I demanded. It was the least she could do. It was her boyfriend who had caused it all. And then I stopped. Her boyfriend. I couldn't, she said in a quiet, desperate voice. He killed Bob. Oh, maybe Bob asked for it. I know he did. But I couldn't ever look at the person who killed him. You only knew his bad side. He could be sweet sometimes and friendly. But when he got drunk, it was that part of him that beat up Johnny. I knew it was Bob when you told me the story. He was so proud of his rings. Why do people sell liquor to boys? Why? I know there's a law against it, but kids get it anyway. I can't go see Johnny. I know I'm too young to be in love and all that, but Bob was something special. He wasn't just any boy. He had something that made people follow him, something that marked him different, maybe a little better than the crowd. Do you know what I mean? I did. Cherry saw the same things in Dallas. That was why she was afraid to see him, afraid of loving him. I knew what she meant all right. But she also meant she wouldn't go see Johnny because he had killed Bob. That's okay, I said sharply. It wasn't Johnny's fault Bob was a booze hound and Cherry went for boys who were bound for trouble. I wouldn't want you to see him. You're a traitor to your own kind and not loyal to us. Do you think your spying for us makes up for the fact that you're sitting there in a Corvette while my brother drops out of school to get a job? Don't you ever feel sorry for us? Don't you ever try to give us handouts and then feel high and mighty about it? I started to turn and walk off, but something in Cherry's face made me stop. I was ashamed. I can't stand to see girls cry. She wasn't crying, but she was close to it. I wasn't trying to give you charity, pony boy. I only wanted to help. I liked you from the start, the way you talked. You're a nice kid, pony boy. Do you realize how scarce nice kids are nowadays? Wouldn't you try to help me if you could? I would. I'd help her and Randy both if I could. Hey, I said suddenly, can you see the sunset real good from the west side? She blinked, startled, then smiled. Real good. You can see it good from the east side too, I said quietly. Thanks, pony boy. She smiled through her tears. You dig okay. She had green eyes. I went on, walking home slowly. Chapter 9 It was almost 6.30 when I got home. The rumble was set for 7, so I was late for supper, as usual. I always come in late. I forget what time it is. Darry had cooked dinner. Baked chicken and potatoes and corn. Two chickens, because all three of us eat like horses, especially dairy. But although I loved baked chicken, I could hardly swallow any. I swallowed five aspirins, though, when dairy and soda weren't looking. I do that all the time because I can't sleep very well at night. Dairy thinks I take just one, but I usually take four. 
I figured five would keep me going through the rumble and maybe get rid of my headache. Then I hurried to take a shower and change clothes. Me and Soda and Darry always got spruced up before a rumble. And besides, we wanted to show those socias we weren't trash, that we were just as good as they were. Soda, I called from the bathroom. When did you start shaving? When I was 15, he yelled back. When did Darry? When he was 13. Why? You figuring on growing a beard for the rumble? You're funny. We ought to send you into the Reader's Digest. I heard they pay a lot for funny things. Soda laughed and went right on playing poker with Steve in the living room. Darry had on a tight black t-shirt that showed every muscle on his chest and even the flat, hard muscles of his stomach. I'd hate to be the soch who takes a crack at him, I thought, as I pulled on a clean t-shirt and a fresh pair of jeans. I wished my t-shirt was tighter. I have a pretty good build for my size, but I'd lost a lot of weight in Windricksville, and it just didn't fit right. It was a chilly night, and t-shirts aren't the warmest clothes in the world, but nobody ever gets cold in a rumble, and besides, jackets interfere with your swinging ability. Soda and Steve and I had put on more hair oil than was necessary, but we wanted to show that we were greasers. Tonight, we could be proud of it. Greasers may not have much, but they have a rep. That and long hair. What kind of a world is it where all I have to be proud of is a reputation for being a hood and greasy hair? I don't want to be a hood, but even if I don't steal things and mug people and get boozed up, I'm marked lousy. Why should I be proud of it? Why should I even pretend to be proud of it? Darry never went in for long hair. His was short and clean all the time. I sat in the armchair in the living room, waiting for the rest of the outfit to show up. But of course, tonight the only one coming would be two-bit. Johnny and Dallas wouldn't show. Soda and Steve were playing cards and arguing as usual. Soda was keeping up a steady stream of wisecracks and clowning, and Steve had turned up the radio so loud that it almost broke my eardrums. Of course, everybody listens to it loud like that, but it wasn't just the best thing for a headache. You like fights, don't you, Soda? I asked suddenly. Yeah, sure, he shrugged. I like fights. How come? I don't know. He looked at me puzzled. It's action. It's a contest, like a drag race or a dance or something. Shoot, said Steve. I want to beat those socials' heads in. When I get into a fight, I want to stomp the other guy good. I like it, too. How come you like fights, Derry? I asked, looking up at him as he stood behind me, leaning in the kitchen doorway. He gave me one of those looks that hide what he's thinking, but Soda piped up. He likes to show off his muscles. I'm going to show them off on you, little buddy, if you get any mouthier. I digested what Soda had said. It was the truth. Darry liked anything that took strength, like weightlifting or playing football or roofing houses, even if he was proud of being smart, too. Darry never said anything about it, but I knew he liked fights. I'll fight anyone, anytime, but I don't like to. I don't know if you ought to be in this rumble, Pony, Derry said slowly. Oh, no, I thought in mortal fear. I've got to be in it. Right then, the most important thing in my life was helping us whip the socias. Don't let him make me stay home now. I've got to be in it. How come? I've always come through before, ain't I? Yeah, Derry said with a proud grin. You fight real good for a kid your size. But you were in shape before. You've lost weight, and you don't look so great, kid. You're tensed up too much. Shoot, said Soda, trying to get the ace out of his shoe without Steve seeing him. We all get tensed up before a rumble. Let him fight tonight. Skin never hurt anyone. No weapons, no danger. I'll be okay, I pleaded. I'll get hold of a little one, okay? Well, Johnny won't be there this time. Johnny and I sometimes ganged up on one big guy. But then Curly Shepard won't be there either, or Dally, and we'll need every man we can get. What happened to Shepard, I asked, remembering Tim Shepard's kid brother. 
Curly, who was a tough, cool, hard-as-nails Tim in miniature, and I had once played chicken by holding our cigarette ends against each other's fingers. We had stood there, clenching our teeth and grimacing, with sweat pouring down our faces and the smell of burning flesh making us sick, each refusing to holler until Tim happened to stroll by. When he saw that we were really burning holes in each other, he cracked our heads together, swearing to kill us both if we ever pulled a stunt like that again. I still have the scar on my forefinger. Curly was an average downtown hood, tough and not real bright, but I liked him. He could take anything. He's in the cooler, Steve said, kicking the ace out of Soda's shoe. In the reformatory. Again, I thought, and said, let me fight, Darry. If it was blades or chains or something, it'd be different. Nobody ever gets really hurt in a skin rumble. Well, Darry gave in. I guess you can. But be careful, and if you get in a jam, holler and I'll get you out. I'll be okay, I said wearily. How come you never worry about soda pop as much? I don't see you lecturing him. Man, Darry grinned and put his arm across Soda's shoulders. This is one kid brother I don't have to worry about. Soda punched him in the ribs affectionately. This kiddo can use his head. Soda Pop looked down at me with mock superiority, but Darry went on. You can see he uses it for one thing, to grow hair on. He ducked Soda's swing and took off for the door. Two-Bit stuck his head in the door just as Darry went flying out of it. Leaping as he went off the steps, Darry turned a somersault in midair, hit the ground, and bounced up before Soda could catch him. Welp! Two-Bit said cheerfully, cocking an eyebrow. I see we are in prime condition for a rumble. Is everybody happy? Yeah! screamed Soda as he too did a flying somersault off the steps. He flipped up to walk on his hands and then did a no-hands cartwheel across the yard to beat Darry's performance. The excitement was catching. Screeching like an Indian, Steve went running across the lawn in flying leaps, stopped suddenly, and flipped backwards. We could all do acrobatics because Darry had taken a course at the Y and then spent a whole summer teaching us everything he'd learned on the grounds that it might come in handy in a fight. It did, but it also got Two-Bit and Soda jailed once. They were doing mid-air flips down a downtown sidewalk, walking on their hands, and otherwise disturbing the public and the police. Leave it to those two to pull something like that. With a happy whoop, I did a no-hands cartwheel off the porch steps, hit the ground, and rolled to my feet. Two-Bit followed me in a similar manner. I am a greaser. Soda Pop chanted. I am a JD and a hood. I blacken the name of our fair city. I beat up people. I rob gas stations. I am a menace to society. Man, do I have fun. Greaser, 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 Steve sing-songed. Oh, victim of environment, underprivileged, rotten, no-count hood. Juvenile delinquent, you're no good, Darry shouted. Get thee hence, white trash, Two-Bit said in a snobbish voice. I am a soch. I am the privileged and the well-dressed. I throw beer blasts, drive fancy cars, break windows at fancy parties. And what do you do for fun? I inquired in a serious, odd voice. I jump greasers, Two-Bit screamed and did a cartwheel. We settled down as we walked to the lot. Two-Bit was the only one wearing a jacket. He had a couple of cans of beer stuffed in it. He always gets high before a rumble. Before anything else, too, come to think of it. I shook my head. I'd hate to see the day when I had to get my nerve from a can. I'd tried drinking once before. The stuff tasted awful. I got sick, had a headache, and when Darry found out, he grounded me for two weeks. But that was the last time I'd ever drink. I'd seen too much of what drinking did for you at Johnny's house. Hey, Two-Bit, I said, deciding to complete my survey. How come you like to fight? He looked at me as if I was off my nut. Shoot, everybody fights. 
If everybody jumped in the Arkansas River, old Two-Bit would be right on their heels. I had it then. Soda fought for fun, Steve for hatred, Darry for pride, and Two-Bit for conformity. Why do I fight? I thought and couldn't think of any real good reason. There isn't any real good reason for fighting except self-defense. Listen, Soda, you and Pony Boy, Darry said as we strode down the street, if the fuzz show, you two beat it out of there. The rest of us can only get jailed. You two can get sent to a boy's home. Nobody in this neighborhood's gonna call the fuzz, Steve said grimly. They know what'd happen if they did. All the same, you two blow at the first sign of trouble, you hear me? You sure don't need an amplifier, Soda said, and stuck out his tongue at the back of Darry's head. I stifled the giggle. If you want to see something funny, it's a tough hood sticking his tongue out at his big brother. Tim Shepard and company were already waiting when we arrived at the vacant lot, along with a gang from Brumley, one of the suburbs. Tim was a lean, cat-like 18-year-old who looked like the model J.D. you see in movies and magazines. He had the right curly black hair, smoldering dark eyes, and a long scar from temple to chin where a tramp had belted him with a broken pop bottle. He had a tough, hard look to him, and his nose had been broken twice. Like Dally's, his smile was grim and bitter. He was one of those who enjoy being a hood. The rest of his bunch were the same way. The boys from Brumley, too. Young hoods, who would grow up to be old hoods. I'd never thought about it before, but they'd just get worse as they got older, not better. I looked at Darry. He wasn't going to be any hood when he got old. He was going to get somewhere. Living the way we do would only make him more determined to get somewhere. That's why he's better than the rest of us, I thought. He's going somewhere, and I was going to be like him. I wasn't going to live in a lousy neighborhood all my life. Tim had the tense, hungry look of an alley cat. That's what he always reminded me of, an alley cat. And he was constantly restless. His boys ranged from 15 to 19, hard-looking characters who were used to the strict discipline Tim gave out. That was the difference between his gang and ours. They had a leader and were organized. We were just buddies who stuck together. Each man was his own leader. Maybe that's why we could whip them. Tim and the leader of the Brumley outfit moved forward to shake hands with each of us, proving that our gangs were on the same side in this fight, although most of the guys in those two outfits weren't exactly what I'd like to call my friends. When Tim got to me, he studied me, maybe remembering how his kid brother and I had played chicken. You and the quiet, black-headed kid were the ones who killed that soch? Yeah, I said, pretending to be proud of it. Then I thought of Cherry and Randy and got a sick feeling in my stomach. Good going, kid. Curly always said you were a good kid. Curly's in the reformatory for the next six months. Tim grinned ruefully, probably thinking of his roughneck, hard-headed brother. He got caught breaking into a liquor store, the little. He went on to call Curly every unprintable name under the sun. In Tim's way of thinking, terms of affection. I surveyed the scene with pride. I was the youngest one there. Even Curly, if he had been there, had turned 15, so he was older than me. I could tell Derry realized this too, and although he was proud, I also knew he was worried. Shoot, I thought. I'll fight so good this time, he won't ever worry about me again. I'll show him that someone besides Soda Pop can use his head. One of the Brumley guys waved me over. We mostly stuck with our own outfits, so I was a little leery of going over to him, but I shrugged. He asked to borrow a weed, then lit up. That big guy with y'all, you know him pretty well? I ought to. He's my brother, I said. I couldn't honestly say yes. I knew Darry as well as he knew me, and that isn't saying a whole lot. No kidding. I got a feeling he's going to be asked to start the fireworks around here. He a pretty good bopper? He meant rumbler. Those Brumley boys have weird vocabularies. 
I doubt if half of them can read a newspaper or spell much more than their names, and it comes out in their speech. Okay, so we're going to stop at. Now, there's a lot of foreshadowing happening here. He has these headaches in Chapter 7. He's also, in Chapter 8, he's nauseous, and he's sleepy, and he has this fever, and he has this headache that's continuing. What does he probably have? A concussion. A concussion, thank you. Now, he has this concussion, but then he also has a premonition again, like he had at the church, that he feels like that night something bad's going to happen. Now, do you think that something's going to happen in, in the rumble, or do you think something's going to happen after that? Maybe. Maybe it had maybe something's gonna happen after the rumble or because of the rumble. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. And um, also right here we have uh, we saw we met we didn't see we met uh, Johnny's mother today. So what do you think about her? I mean, what the heck does she have coming up in the hospital talking about? I've been caring for him. We raised him up. Have they raised him? No, they don't care about him, and that she's just making a show of it. So, all right, uh, put your stuff up, and we will um, get ready to get cleaned up.